Good morning and afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our bonus depreciation update and cost segregation tax planning webinar. We like to begin all of our webinars with a little background on our company. KBKG is headquartered in Pasadena, California, with additional offices in Ohio, Illinois, Georgia, New York, and Texas. Since 1999, we have successfully conducted thousands of studies nationwide. KBKG's team has performed studies on facilities ranging size from 10,000 to over 1 million square feet, resulting in a deferral of hundreds of millions of dollars in taxes. We also have highly qualified engineering and tax professionals on staff. Our engineering department has extensive construction experience in reading plans and utilizing RS means and Marshall and Swift cost estimation techniques. Our tax department provides support for all cost segregation tax-related issues, including 1031 exchanges, AMT, passive activity, abandonment write-offs, and lease provisions. We are a preferred provider for thousands of CPAs across the country. Now I will turn it over to our presenter, John, so he can tell you a little bit about himself. John? Thanks so much, Marian. Yes, and everybody welcome, and happy Halloween. Uh, just a little bit about me prior to getting started. Uh, I'm a director here at KBKG, uh, specifically in the fixed assets and cost segregation practice. I'm also a member of the uh, ASCS, AMCS uh, Accounting Methods and Services Group. Uh, what we do is uh, provide compliance around um, the repairs and maintenance. Uh, there's construction tax planning. Uh, and a couple of other services, um, including uh, completing the uh, method changes that everybody's been scrambling to complete over the last several years. A couple of degrees there, Ohio is a theme. I'm also um, a certified member of ASCSP, which is American Society of Cost Segregation Professionals, and in fact, I'm currently the treasurer of that uh, organization. So uh, the slide you have in front of you now, uh, Protecting Americans Against Tax Hikes, uh, this is the PATH Act. This um, extended bonus depreciation through 2019. I have a nice slide that kind of shows you how the step down uh, occurs uh, from 2018 through 2019. Uh, it made qualified leasehold improvement, qualified retail improvement, and qualified restaurant uh, a permanent provision. And it also introduced something completely new. This is a qualified improvement property. It is like or akin to a qualified leasehold improvement property, but it is a little bit different. So uh, we'll talk uh, extensively about qualified improvement property, which is, again, new. Bonus depreciation rules are generally the same as found in Section 168K. And as we move forward here, Bonus depreciation, there's certain criteria. Uh, so property will qualify for bonus depreciation as long as the following four requirements are met. Now, um, its property is a specific type. Now, there's specific uh, property that's called out um, by the regulations, and if it's that specific type of property, then it will qualify for bonus. It has to be original use, and oftentimes I get questions about, well, what, is it, what does that mean? Essentially, it just can't be secondhand. I can't go out and buy in 2000 and let's say 15 a used 2009 car and place in service. Of course, it's new to me, uh, but it's not original use. Uh, acquisition of property, and then of course, um, it has to be uh, placed in service during a certain date. Bonus depreciation originally uh, was brought forth uh, in September. Um, 11th of 2001, there was a significant event, I think we all remember it, um, and uh, then it went away for a while, it was 30%, then it bumped up to 50%, it was 100% in 2011, uh, and then back down. So um, the property has to, you have to understand when that uh, bonus uh, property was uh, placed in service, because it's going to dictate whether or not you're going to get bonus, and at what rate you may or may not get bonus. So the PATH Act, uh, PATH Act extends bonus, uh, and I told you this little graph, uh, there's a step down um, through 2019. So uh, you can see from 2012 to 2017, there's 50% bonus on new use property. Um, 
as long as you meet the other criteria. It steps down to 40% bonus in 2018. So right now we've got construction projects going on. You know, sometimes we're thinking, oh, we would, I guess we'll just place it in service in the first quarter of 2018. Well, you may be missing out on 10% on of the bonus because if you can, you may want to place that, that item in service in 2017 or prior to the year coming out. Um, if not, and it rolls over to 2018, um, that place in the service date is going to dictate 40% bonus rather than 50% bonus. And then finally, uh, in 2019, it steps down to 30% bonus. Uh, there were some software updates that occurred uh, already uh, to most systems. We've never had 40% bonus. Um, it was 30, went away, came back to 50, 100, and then um, you know down to 30 finally. But we've never seen 40% bonus, so a software update occurred to most people's uh, systems. So the qualified real property. Now, we discussed this a little bit, but the qualified leasehold improvement property has been around uh, for quite some time. Um, qualified improvement property, however, or QIP, uh, is new this year. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, qualified restaurant and qualified retail property uh, within this uh, within the slide deck. So qualified leasehold improvements. Again, been around for a while. Uh, QLIs, um, oftentimes referred to. So this is any section 1250 property, uh, which is an improvement to a non-residential real property. So it's a, what does that mean? That means that it's long life property. It's not personal property. Um, it's real property, 1250 property. Uh, and then it's uh, commercial property. It's not uh, residential rental. It occurs to the interior portion of the building, uh, which is occupied exclusively by the lessee. So it can't be done to a common area. So sometimes there's you know, a common elevator bank or something like that that's uh, done. Nope, it can't, uh, does not qualify. Um, and uh, it'll be kicked out of qualified leasehold improvement treatment. It has to be placed into service more than three years after the building was originally placed in service. So. It has the building has to be three years old. So oftentimes, what we see is a strip center goes in, and then it takes a little while for the owner of that strip center to to get all the tenants in there. Um, maybe even peek through the windows, and you can see that there's still kind of a gravel pad. Um, what they're trying to encourage is renovations to existing space, not just hey, we build a brand new building, then we found the tenant, and now we're, that tenant's going to get a qualified. Uh, leasehold improvement property um, that would in qualified leasehold improvement property uh, kick it out so the three-year rule stands and remains uh, it must be uh, pursuant to a lease so um, you have to have um, uh, a non-related parties so it's got to be an arm length, arm's length transaction sometimes people refer to it as it's basically I own the building but Walmart comes in and leases that building from me um, most oftentimes we see this in a uh, office space or retail environment. Uh, and it's going to be depreciated over 15 years uh, and does qualify for bonus. So again, this is qualified leasehold improvement property. It's going to be 15 years and gets bonus. And this is and gets bonus on 1250 property or long life property. So it can be very, very powerful uh, as long as you know the rules and can prove um, that all costs uh, related to that improvement are, in fact, uh, qualified leasehold improvement property. Now, a, a couple of caveats. Um, qualified leasehold improvement property does not include um, costs related to the enlargement of a building, um, elevators, escalators, interior structural framework. Sometimes I get questions of, well, what do you mean? Well, if you're just moving around partitional walls, something that's not structural, to the uh, actual interior portion of the building, that that will qualify. Um, but as soon as you start moving around beams or you're putting in um, uh, new footings and that kind of stuff, you, you know you're going to get kicked out, uh, at least for that segment of the work. And then as discussed before, you know structural components that uh, benefit a common area. So. Here's the caveat, which is many taxpayers make a mistake of claiming bonus on all tenant improvements. I've seen it time and time and again. Um, the client comes to them and says, yeah, I just built out this new space just to stop by. It's really, 
really beautiful. And uh, this could be, you know, oftentimes a retailer, but what they do is is take all. So the CPA takes all of that, and every bit of it, boom, goes immediately into um, qualified leasehold improvement property. It's pretty powerful because you know that's what they that's the answer they want. Fifteen years on the long life property and 50% bonus in, in certain time frames. Now, but during that, what they did is, and they didn't, and the CPA probably didn't look at uh, the scope of work, but during that they put some storefront glass in. Well, that's on the exterior of the building. Well, the part of that, you know, putting the interior shelves in and painting and moving some partition walls and some carpeting, they also re-roofed the building. And in fact, uh, not only did they re-roof the building, that they put some new air handlers on the roof, rooftop units. Um, of course, these rooftop units or HVAC units are servicing the interior of the building, but both the roof and the rooftop units are in the exterior portion of the building, so they would not qualify. So just be careful. Don't just take the cost saying, oh, yep, we build out the interior of our space. That's the lion's share of what they did, but certain costs might need to be removed. And if called on it, uh, it could be pretty impactful uh, to the numbers uh, given that bonus was taken. So here's a related party lease um, example, and I'll run you through it real quick. Um, we, we looked that there was an 80% threshold on one of the slides, and this will kind of uh, speak to that. So Penny and Leonard are business partners, which own a research and development business called Bazinga, and they leased the space from a, a real estate holding company called TBBT LLC. So the R&D business ownership is 50% Penny and 50% Leonard. Now, the real estate owner um, is actually 35% Penny, 35% Leonard. Sheldon has 20%, Howard has 5 and Raj has 5 Well, the 35 and 35 combined ownership to be 70%. Well, because the related party's lease is less than 80%, they actually would get and would receive qualified leasehold improvement treatment, um, get 15 years, and very likely get what? bonus appreciation. Please. Again, there's a little bit of background noise, Miriam. Thanks. Now, qualified improvement property, uh, a QIP. This is the one that I, I talked about being uh, new this year. And this is very important because it follows a lot of the same logic and rules that qualified leasehold improvement property does. But I think what we're going to find is that it's going to be open to uh, many more folks. Um, many more people are going to qualify for it. And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean as we go through some of the criteria. So it's any improvement to the interior portion of the building, which is non-residential uh, real property. Sounds pretty much the same so far, right? Um, if such improvement was placed in service after the date the building was first placed in service. Okay, that suggests there's no three-year rule, three year rule. So the building was originally placed in service, and maybe then they looked for a tenant for a while and then started building it out? Then yes, so that three-year rule is gone. Uh, the property must be placed in service after 2015. And replaces the bonus deduction for QLI. Um, now, quote, note, this is depreciated over 39 years, but is eligible for bonus. Oftentimes, I, I know I review a lot of things, and uh, a lot of folks on the phone, uh, maybe our CPAs, and they're reviewing some of their, their tax staff work. Oftentimes, we see, wait a minute, bonus on long-life property? This can't be right. That's got to be wrong, red pen, right? Well, in this case, that's not the case. Uh, that's not true. There will be 39-year property, but we'll get bonus. And if you ever see that, uh, what you want to start digging for is, okay, how is this qualified improvement property? So qualified improvement property, like uh, qualified leasehold improvement property, doesn't uh, pertain to or, or include any cost for the enlargement of the building, escalators or elevators. Uh, or certainly any interior structural framework. So again, very much like uh, qualified leasehold improvement, but it is not qualified leasehold improvement, it is qualified improvement property, um, eliminating um, the uh, 
uh, related party lease rules and also eliminating the three-year rule. So qualified restaurant property. Uh, this has been around a while. Uh, you will probably have run into it before. Um, this is 15-year depreciable life, which has now been permanently extended through the PATH Act. So the definition of, of key rest is any 1250 property uh, that um, is in a building or or is part of an improvement to a building where at least 50% of the building square footage is devoted to the preparation, uh, seating, and, and consumption of prepared meals. So the photo there um, is, is kind of an example. You've got a, GM, a GNC, Hallmark, a Subway, and then uh, kind of a Mexican restaurant down in the corner. Let's just, you know, for uh, for example purposes, uh, say that they were all 25% uh, of that building, that overall building. Well, evenly. Well, 50% of the subway in the Mexican restaurant um, would would take up um, the total square footage of the building and would be devoted to the preparation of prepared meals. So that would actually any anything done to all four of those restaurants or all four of those uh, suites or retail spots uh, actually could be qualified restaurant property. And again, it, and this, this is a term that comes from the tangible property regs, but it's, it's called unit of property. The building itself is the unit of property. So you, it may be connected um, to another building on one far end. Um, then that's a different assessment. Maybe it's not connected, but close. Um, the unit of property is that separate building, or you have to look at it from uh, the what is the building, what is the unit of property, and then apply your 50%. And our first polling question is coming in the next slide. I have front-loaded uh, or back-loaded the, the, the polling question, so uh, they'll be coming at you a little bit uh, faster here uh, in the next uh, several minutes. So qualified retail improvement property, again, this has been around a while. Um, it's similar to qualified restaurant property in that its 15-year depreciable life was permanently extended in the PATH Act. Um, now, this is any improvement to the interior portion of the building, of course, which is non-residential, but is subject to a portion that is open to the general public um, and used in the retail trade. So this is your hallmark, and this is your GNCs you know, across the nation. Again, this does have the three-year rule included, as qualified leasehold improvement property does. You can't build a building um, and then place in service 24 months later, move into it, and then get that uh, qualified retail treatment. So bonus requirements, and here are the nuances. Um, again, this is I kind of view this as the second half of the um, of the um, of the day here. Uh, qualified improvement property chart. Uh, we'll kind of discuss self-constructed property and the written binding rules contracts. Um, we'll also talk about long production period property. I think this is probably the most confusing uh, subject out of you know all the subjects we're going to cover today. But um, finally, we'll close out with you know planning considerations. What great all this information uh, was just absorbed, but what should I do? What what do I need to maybe do for my clients? So we'll close that out um, with some planning considerations. Here I think is the most helpful slide. If you forget everything else today, download uh, and extract this one slide, uh, hang it on your office wall, uh, put it in those uh, important documents. But uh, essentially what it is is a cheat sheet. This is a, a, a chart that helps explain when um, and the certain rules that uh, pertain to uh, qualified uh, leasehold, retail, restaurant, and improvement property, but then also whether it's bonus eligible or not. So we'll just pick one here. Um, qualified restaurant property from 2004 to 2007. Was it bonus eligible? No. Uh, did it have the three-year rule? Yes. Um, and unrelated parties rule? No. So, um, and it's depreciated over 15 years. So that changed um, in 2008, okay? In 2008, actually, it did get bonus, 
and that's just a little sliver of a rule that based then in 2009 it again did not get bonus so again these aren't the easiest rules to keep track of um, you know sometimes we we look at this and you know what when I know it gets bonus but is it 30 percent bonus or um, it might not get bonus I'm, restaurant property had bonus in one year I forget this is your chart and this is your sheet uh, that will certainly help allow uh, you to keep things straight you'll see the qualify all the way at the bottom the qualified improvement property this is 39 year property yet gets bonus so you know don't uh, don't get tripped up or don't red red mark up somebody's um, some staff person's uh, depreciation schedule when when handing it in for review uh, it actually does get bonus uh, for long life property in this scenario Self-constructed property. What exactly is self-constructed property? So this is property, uh, and it's going to seem a little self-explanatory, but uh, I, I think once we get into a few slides, you'll you'll understand the confusion. So, uh, the property that's constructed by the taxpayer. This is how most property is um, constructed. There's a, con a client. Let's say Amazon. They want to build a building. Well, they're going to go out and get a contractor, and that contractor is going to build it to spec. And at some point, um, Amazon's going to take ownership of it. What a contractor is not going to do uh, is go out and build a building for Amazon, hoping that, geez, that's the building that Amazon wanted. Um, that's a, a little bit different scenario. So most of the time, it's self-constructed property. So um, it's constructed for a taxpayer. Uh, by another person under written and binding contract rules. So they enter uh, into this written binding contract prior to starting the manufacturing of construction. What we say is before the shovels hit the ground, um, they've entered into a written binding contract to have this developed. If you sign a contract before the construction begins, uh, it's self-constructed property. Self-constructed property is not subject to um, the written binding contract, um, but subject to certain other rules. So it, it basically is just understanding um, when construction began. Understanding when construction began uh, might determine, hey, it's 50% bonus versus it's 40% bonus. And I'll give you a couple examples of what I mean by that in the next few slides. So buildings acquired versus cell constructed. Um, it's certainly important to understand the difference. Now, so acquired property is uh, a client signs a contract uh, to acquire a property after the construction begins. This is that contractor that uh, went out on its own and built the building hoping Amazon might buy it, right? Um, I don't think that's ever going to happen, but if it did, um, this is, a, this is a scenario you'd find yourself in. Um, there's a little bit of that that goes on in the retail world. Um, you know, there's certain anchor shop. You know, there's a strip center, and certain anchor shops um, are spec'd out. You know, you know, in a strip mall, there's going to be a Lowe's or a Home Depot, right? Um, they may build it knowing that the the Home Depot is uh, already down the street. As a Lowe's, kind of put that little configuration on the front end of it, um, and then you know, oftentimes. Uh, they'll accept that contract. So the date of the contract is highly rel relevant um, to the bonus eligibility here in the acquired property rules. Again, it's still new use, right? It's still being constructed, but it's dependent on you know when the contract was, was signed. So self-constructed property, uh, as discussed before, the client's signing a contract to acquire the property before construction. Uh, begins or before the shovels hit the ground. So in this scenario, uh, the date of the contract is not relevant uh, to bonus depreciation. However, you must consider um, the 10% safe harbor rules, and I'll uh, talk about that going forward here. Here's an example uh, under the acquired property. So a developer begins construction of a building on 1-1-2017. So, coming up.
tomorrow, right? Um, I've had this same slide in here for for months. I guess this is uh, tomorrow. They're they're gonna um, begin construction. Uh, the taxpayers signed the written binding contract um, on 12 28 2017. So not yet, right? Um, they're gonna do it uh, during the holidays. So the property was placed in service by the taxpayer in 2018. So once it was ready for its intended use after some point uh, you know, in 2018. So the eligible costs qualify for 50% bonus depreciation because the written binding contract was signed before 2018. So had they delayed a little bit in not construction, but in the, uh, actually uh, signing the documents, uh, they could have gone from 50% to 40% bonus. Uh, so this is considered acquired property because it was uh, assigned after uh, the shovels hit the ground. Um, note that this may qualify for 40% bonus, uh, of course, if the definition of self-constructed property uh, in 2018. So again, a another example uh, to kind of all lay it, lay it out and, and tie it together is for the self-constructed property example, the taxpayer signed a written binding contract in uh, early part of this year, 3-28-2017. Uh, the developer begins construction, again, same date as before, tomorrow, 11-1-2017, uh, and the property is placed in service by the taxpayer again in 2018. Uh, this is self-constructed property. Eligible costs qualify for 40% bonus because They've placed it in service now uh, in, uh, let's say, any time after 1-1-2018. One, one, so the written and binding contract rules, it, it's kind of, uh, I always debate on whether to put this uh, slide a little uh, further up in my slide deck, but um, act, applicable to acquire property only. Uh, so, uh, as as we talked about, if it's self-constructed, uh, you know that date isn't that important. Uh, but of course, for um, acquired property, it is very important. So, the regulations provide you know detailed guidance on the definition of binding and con uh, written binding contract rules. Um, the one thing to note here is substantial changes to the contract outside of a bonus period may create an opportunity. What it may do is uh, significantly change the contract, um, even, and what is significant, that's uh, not been defined, but um, it may significantly change, even if it's a, 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 you know, what we would seem as a minor uh, change order, um, it could change the contract significantly or enough that um, would allow us to, uh, take a different bonus over another. So uh, here's a planning consideration for an acquired property. If you sign a written binding contract after construction began, uh, you look to see if any substantial changes were made uh, to the contract during the bonus eligible period. The contract signed in July of 2017, that's 50% bonus, but significant, were, significant changes were made in 2018, um, which is a 40% uh, bonus depreciation. So change orders of, of size may constitute a significant change. When does construction begin on self-constructed property? Uh, the construction of, of a property begins when the physical work of a significant nature uh, begins. So this, there are some rules around this and it's, it's very easy to understand, but um, this does not include preliminary activities such as planning, design. So if you send somebody out there to do, you know, kind of a water table check or uh, soil testing and that kind of stuff, the exploration of all that, um, that is not work of, uh, of a significant nature and not defined as such. In the safe harbor rules, uh, construction begins after a taxpayer pays or incurs more than 10% of the total cost of the property. So again, this is excluding you know purchasing the land and or you know any testing or exploration that's done. So um, accrual basis, even if the taxpayer didn't yet pay 10%, obviously we're always you know uh, paying things in arrears. 
uh, you know, net 30 or whatever it might be, um, but 10% of the constructed is construction is completed, uh, that's going to note that work has begun. I have my next polling question coming up next, but prior to that, uh, maximizing bonus uh, deductions using cost segregation. Uh, cost segregation studies reclassify a substantial portion of the real property assets. So essentially, what it's a time value of money concept. Uh, you know, a tax uh, professional knows that you know if you're front loading depreciation, uh, you're getting you know more for uh, for your money now. The net present value will say. Hey, a dollar, you know, today is worth a whole lot more to me than a dollar tomorrow or 39 years from now. So, you know, typically tax lives are, are 39 years or 27 and a half years, commercial property or residential rental property. Uh, but if doing a cost, cost seg, um, bonus depreciation will likely, if constructed or new use, um, will be applied to assets recovered over 5, 15, uh, or seven years. So a cost seg basically allows you know, a taxpayer uh, building a, a new building or constructing a new leasehold improvement uh, to take full advantage of the bonus rules. Um, cost seg, essentially what it's doing is trying to identify personal property uh, among the real property assets. So special piping, fixtures, certain finishes, carpentry, millwork, that kind of thing. Uh, what they're trying to grab there is um, all that personal property that's mixed in with, um, you know, the overall uh, uh, real property assets. So it might just say flooring. Well, if it does say flooring, it could be ceramic tile, and we need to code that as, in a commercial setting, 39 years. But if it's carpet, even in a commercial setting, we could list it as uh, a five-year asset instead. If we do list it as a five-year asset, we're going to get bonus. Uh, of course, we need to fall within the bonus window, but uh, and meet a couple of other criteria. But uh, that's that's pretty much uh, in general the case. So long production period property it has a recovery period of uh, at least 10 years, uh, or is transportation property. There's a couple of uh, 263A uh, in the capital A uh, rules. Uh, and has production period exceeding one year or a cost of exceeding one million dollars. So that's kind of the definition of, of long production period property. We're also going to talk about qualified leasehold improvements uh, can be qualified or long production period property. Uh, now there's been, the reason I bring this up is there's been a one year extension of bonus um, and meaning if it's been extended through 2019 we may take it through 2020, and I have a little chart that shows you what I mean. Eligible, eligible basis uh, is lesser of the payments made or a percentage completed by 12-31-2019. Uh, and that graph uh, is on the next page, but we'll kind of, uh, again, clarify, you know, what is a long production period property. A clarification that um, LPPP started in 2017 can still get 50% bonus depreciation on the entire basis as long as it's placed in service in 2018. Now, when it comes to 2017, um, if construction is over a million dollars, the construction period is close to the year, it may be advisable to instruct your client to extend construction over a year. Uh, for that 50% bonus, opposed to then getting the 2018 40% bonus. And again, that's a real tricky way of, of saying just what you have in front of you. This, this timeline shows that I think the best. So long production period property is here in the red, uh, where general bonus um, is in the green. Basically, what it's doing is it's kicking out um, or extending bonus for long production period property um, by just one year. So in 2018, if uh, long production period property, um, you could get 50% bonus in 2018, where everything else, it's, it's going to sunset. 50% bonus is going to sunset for everybody else at the end of 2017. 
again, what I had mentioned earlier is that you know we all know that uh, and, and, and understand through kind of taking this seminar is that uh, after 1231-2019, bonus is going to cease to exist. Well, that's not totally true if uh, you meet the definition of long production period property. And if we get to 2019 without any major tax reform, I would be shocked either way. Uh, so this may or may not uh, pertain um, uh, as we uh, get closer and closer to uh, tax reform. So planning considerations, uh, state conformity. Now most states uh, decouple from you know federal to pro, uh, federal bonus depreciation. Um, they disallow it or modify it. Um, it was mentioned that we were, you know, as a firm, we're headquartered in uh, Pasadena, uh, California. California is a non-conforming state. So um, some states don't provide uh, the provision, the 15-year provision for qualified leasehold improvement, QRES, uh, qualified restaurant property, and so on and so forth. So um, it, it it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do a cost seg if you're just trying to pick up the bonus, um, but it's certainly something you want to look into uh, to see if if your state uh, conforms or or does not, uh, so you can you know modify it accordingly within those uh, uh, that state um, depreciation schedule. So cost segregation uh, in recent developments in case law, there was a, a poll or there was a question in here, tangible property regulations, capital versus repair. Um, they were released in their temporary form back in 2011. September 2013 is when they came out in their final form. Um, what essentially everybody did is scrambled to figure out what that means for them. Um, there were some doom and gloom folks out there that said every single person that has an asset needs to file a method change, um, and here's the 13 different method changes you need to file. Well, um, that ended up not being the case. There was some clarification uh, for some small taxpayers, uh, but if you were a capital-intensive taxpayer, a large capital-intensive taxpayer, more than likely uh, you had a study done, um, even if it was just a fixed asset scrub or a comprehensive fixed asset review, uh, to understand what method changes need to occur. Again, this is what we're talking about here in this slide deck is, is mainly, you know, capital improvements. Um, we've already determined that um, it need to be it needs to be capitalized versus expensed, and now we're trying to decide whether it gets bonus or not, or what special treatment it may get or may not get. But uh, there is a webinar out there. Uh, there is one coming up for Thursday of this week, so um, stay tuned. That's you know. Uh, kind of, uh, it's a two-hour webinar, and it's you know kind of talks about the compliance around 263 small a. Um, there were many uh, accounting method changes uh, made, um, most of which were favorable for the taxpayer. I think in, at the end of the day, the tangible property regs uh, were a welcome sight. Not a whole lot of people had. Um, no one really had definitions around, okay, what was a repair, what was a unit of property, that was a new concept. Um, but so everybody was kind of leaning on the, on the side of being conservative. Well, uh, most of the studies that we performed, you know, kind of dug in a little bit and found that, you know, geez, all these roof repairs, you know, we can now, uh, you know, eliminate uh, most of those as, uh, as a current year expense and file a method change for that. There's some, some guidance um, that relates to cost segregation and depreciation, and that's what this is kind of going to be geared towards. Um, you know, when a, a certain building expenditures should be expensed, um, whether it's, you know, a roof repair or, you know, a slurry coat seal on a parking lot, um, both of which uh, I'll, I'll tell you are, ex are expenses um, or current year repair. We're seeing those on the depreciation schedule, and now, many years later, how do we treat those? Uh, is is part of you know kind of a comprehensive fixed asset review, or kind of just a review in general? Uh, if you're doing a cost seg and understanding, okay, hey, look, this is um, what I understand the assets to be, but then 
that were put in service in 2000, let's say, in 2010, but then looks like they made some improvements over the years. What do those improvements relate to? Uh, they relate to the building that we're doing the CASEG on. So it's all kind of interconnected and really should be reviewed. Um, there was a clarification of the unit of property definitions. This was, again, like I said, a new concept. There's nine um, nine units of property. I usually say eight, um, but it's really eight building systems plus everything else. Um, so you'll see some confusion around that at times. Um, the bar test, uh, which I think was probably the most significant test uh, that came out of, of the uh, tangible property regs, which is um, the betterment adaptation and restoration rules. Um, you know, and then finally we got uh, after the tangible property regs were released uh, several months later. Uh, you know, we got some disposition guidance, and so the removal of structural components as a disposition. So now taxpayers have the ability to write off the remaining basis of 1250 property um, that have since been removed or taken out of service, um, oftentimes thrown in the landfill. Uh, we don't need to continue to depreciate those if we're, we have removed them in, uh, from service. A, a tangible property regulations example, um, we don't run into this a ton, but you know, I figured I'd uh, uh, lay it out there for you. CPA uh, client spent about three million dollars on renovations in 2009. Again, prior to the, even the temp breaks coming out, uh, they capitalized and depreciated the entire amount. However, KBKG reviewed the invoices, interviewed um, the contractor, uh, which understood. Now we understand the work included a portion of the roof, asphalt patching, resurfacing replace two HVAC condensers, maybe two of 20, uh, and then they painted one room. So the repair rules, uh, the unit of property uh, analysis determines uh, the treatment that, um, hey, look, maybe $350,000 of this $3 million should have been uh, coded as repair deductions, uh, repair costs. So right now, we can, if we go back and file it at the change 184, we can recognize an additional $328,000 uh, on the current year tax filing. So we do this by by uh, filing a 3115 form. Where I get the 328 is certainly just, you know, the 350 minus any depreciation already taken. So it could be could be fruitful. Retirement of a structural component. Here's another example. Uh, KBKG client acquired a $5 million building in 2010. In 2015, about five years after they had uh, acquired the building, they spent another million dollars to remodel a portion of the second floor, ceilings, walls, lighting, so on and so forth. So using you know the IRS approved techniques, uh, KBKG uh, engineer assigns a value to all of those original components Maybe you had a cost seg done in 2010. Uh, a value would have already been applied uh, to that $5 million for those uh, specific assets. And so because now the, in 2015 they were thrown in the garbage, uh, KBKG retirement study determined that uh, the value of the demolished components was $470,000. So again, original cost less than, less than any depreciation already taken gives us the 404. That's the 404 number that can be um, taken immediately in the current year uh, by filing a accounting method change 3115, uh, change number 184. Here's here's a common accounting method changes. I, I think this is getting a little stale, but you know um, something that's on the first line item there. Depreciation changes are under uh, change number seven. We've been doing those for years, right? Um, I think just uh, they're getting a little bit, accounting method changes are getting a little bit more uh, uh, well advertised because of the compliance around 263 small a, but um, a portion uh, or par partial dispositions for non-separately stated assets, roofing systems, so on and so forth. Um, the late partial dispositions is no longer allowed, but current year um, partial dispositions are still allowed. Uh, so you just want to note that. Um, 
removal cost, uh, you know, is uh, is number uh, 21. Uh, I talked about the repairs being uh, a 184 change. So again, just want to make sure if you've got uh, a capital intensive client that has a ton of assets, well, uh, you look at it in several different ways. Is everything appropriately being um, accounted for from a recovery life standpoint. Um, if not, maybe I need a cost seg done, or maybe I need a fixed asset review, or maybe I've got some ghost assets on here that need to be completely removed. Um, or maybe I have some assets on here that shouldn't have been on here in the first place. They should have been an expense uh, based on the new rules. So again, kind of bringing a holistic point of view to those depreciation schedules I think is only wise. Uh, here's a, just a considering KBKG. Um, I won't get uh, too involved in this. Uh, we're coming to the top of the hour here, um, but you know there there are professionals out there um, uh, completing cost segregations um, that may don't maybe don't adhere to the same standards. Um, you know you kind of get what you pay for out there, um, and uh, I just kind of calling to your attention that um, you know KBKG does. Um, is a market leader in, in cost segregation, but also within the uh, um, the tangible property regs uh, compliance work. Uh, we've done many, many, many large um, projects uh, with thousands and thousands and thousands of assets, um, which uh, we're encouraging uh, the service to uh, to to look at because we we, we want to uh, show them how everything's going to be substantiated. 